So like Philip mentioned, I'm a recent graduate of University of Montana. I actually have a, a de master's degree in wildlife biology, but I didn't study wildlife per se. Rather, I studied an interaction um, that's important in determining habitat quality for wildlife. And I'm going to be talking about that today as well. So because my talk is a little bit unusual, it's not a presentation of results, I'm going to give you guys just a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So first I'll be talking about, um, in general, invasion and invasion's um, interaction with ecosystem function, specifically uh, what that means for um, habitat and restoration. So if we're interested in promoting habitat or performing restoration, how this interaction might influence what we do. Secondly, I'll be talking about using soil health metrics to measure ecosystem function and how and why we might want to either incorporate measurements of ecosystem function in our restoration plans um, and, and how we might use soil metrics to look at that. And finally, um, for MPG specifically, I'll be talking about uh, some new analytical equipment that we just purchased and also um, my kind of ideas and plans for this upcoming summer, looking at some of these soil health metrics um, in the context of invasion and how it alters ecosystem function down on the ranch. Okay, so to get started, so this is a picture of Gus from a few years ago. So he's famous. There you go. Um, this is a really lovely site, one of Ilva's field sites. And as managers and researchers, we sometimes get to work uh, in really nice, um, intact systems like this one with a good native plant um, community and just, just delightful places to work in. So in, in working in places like this, we might ask a few different questions. We might ask, for example, what's the composition of the plant community at this site? And in turn, um, given the, the composition of the plant community we see here, what uh, numbers and species of wildlife might be able to be supported by a site like this? And I would say that both of these um, kind of questions, uh, topic areas, tie, fall under the broad umbrella of ecosystem function of a site. So that's going to be a lot of different characteristics of a site, but in general it's kind of the ability of our landscape to maintain itself through time. And in a nice native system like this one, um, that's intact and high functioning, we're going to see a lot of services coming from our ecosystem. So we're going to see things like provisioning services, so forage being produced, for wildlife at that site, um, appropriate amounts of plant available nutrients and rates of nutrient cycling in a site, regulating services uh, like the ability of the site to mitigate the effects of, a, of extreme climatic events, keep disease and pathogen levels low, and finally additional benefits um, really related to human use. So we're, we're kind of drawn to sites like this, right? Like it's really pretty and we want to be here, so we get the additional benefit of like recreation as well coming from the site. And it's important to note that this, this ecosystem function of the site that's giving us these services, it's not only due to what we see in this image above ground, it's also due to the abiotic um, components of soil and the soil microbial community below ground and how those two things work together. Okay, so it's not always really awesome, intact, diverse native systems. A lot more often we're working in systems that look something more like this. So, this is an image of a nice leafy spurge invasion. I love leafy spurge, it's so awesome. Look at it, you can just go in and just replace the native community. I mean, diversity of the site, plant community diversity here has just dropped out. And along with these changes to the plant community, we also see that invasion in general alters ecosystem function. So people have looked at this question, how does invasion alter ecosystem function? Um, in the context of a lot of different invaders and in a lot of different places around the world. And in general, oh, <laughs> in general, it, they find that invasions associated with an increase in biomass production at a site. So you can see here, not only as the plant community change, it just looks like a lot more biomass is being produced, also increases in the amount of plant available nutrients, things like nitrogen and increases in rates of nitrogen cycling. 
So just to kind of show this a different way, like I said before, invasion is associated with alterations in ecosystem function. So if we change the identity of the plant community above ground, we're gonna change the nature of the interaction between above and below ground, changing um, both the abiotic and biotic components of the soil. That in turn is gonna affect ecosystem function. So things like water cycling, carbon cycling, and nutrient cycling. And this interaction um, between invasion and ecosystem function is something that I looked at in my master's degree. And my master's had a few different components, but I'm going to show you just a little bit of data from the field component today. So this, I had sites um, at MPG, and then I also had sites in the Missoula Valley. This is a site, I should make it like a bow. So does anyone know where this is? <laughs> yeah, all right, I wish I had something to give you, but I don't. Um, so this is a field site that I have up Grant Creek, and you can see it's pretty typical of um, some of the kind of remaining range land around the Missoula Valley and that it's a mosaic site. So we have both invaded patches here and then we also have patches of remnant native community. And I took, in, in, um, I took advantage of the mosaic nature of the landscape and what I did was I established field plots that were paired invaded patches with native patches so I could look at invasion and uh, differences that we might see in ecosystem function. So I could see if in our system, if I find the similar patterns to what other people have seen in other systems. All right, and here's what I found. All my figures are set up the same way, so I'll just explain this one. I looked at four different species of invader, cheatgrass, uh, knapweed, leafy spurge, and sulfur sinkofoil. All of the white bars are invaded. All of the black bars are the paired native patches. And this is biomass production. So there were species differences, but in general, I saw um, invasion at my sites was associated with an increase in biomass production. It was also associated with an increase in um, plant available nutrients, in this case, soil nitrate. It was also associated with an increase in rates of nitrogen cycling. And finally, I also looked at abundance of here is ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So this is a soil microbial group. They're responsible for one step in the nitrogen cycle. But what I really want you guys to take home here is that um, associated with invasions, we saw changes in the microbial community below ground. So to think about this kind of in a broader sense, so we're seeing these shifts in ecosystem function. We're seeing shifts in the composition of the microbial community below ground. We're also seeing shifts in uh, the plant community above ground. So <clears throat> in the context of habitat quality, say we have a landscape mosaic like this. This was also one of my field sites. It's on the backside of Mount Sentinel. Um, and here you can see again leafy spurge invasions and then remnant um, native community. There's also some cheatgrass and knapweed in the, in the image if you squint a little bit. As kind of the percentage of total landscape that's invaded versus native changes, so as the invasion grows, even though we're seeing these increases in biomass production in the invaded areas of landscape, you might think, oh, well, maybe that's equaling more forage. You know, there's more biomass in the landscape. But if this biomass being produced is non-preferable forage, that we might actually see uh, less forage being produced even though there's more biomass and resulting less wildlife of interest on the landscape. <coughs> Furthermore, so if we think about this in kind of the context of restoration and legacy, say we have a site like this one and through our restoration efforts we're able to restore that plant community back to something that looks more like this. Well, we might expect Okay, plant communities back, um, so we would expect a return of, if we're, if we're interested in forage production and wildlife, a return of those wildlife species that we're interested in. But that, unfortunately, isn't always the case. Sometimes, rather, we get um, kind of a go what I would call a ghostly lingering presence. So even though we've removed the invaders from the landscape, they might leave a signature on ecosystem function um, even if we return the plant community to what we previously had, we might not see functioning of the landscape as we would expect. OK, 
Okay, so that's kind of just the broad, broad overview introduction. Um, interactions between invasion and ecosystem function. Now I want to talk a little bit about soil health metrics and how we might use these to measure ecosystems in our landscape. So before I talk about soil health metrics proper, I want to say a couple of things about soil. So soil has both inherent and dynamic properties. Um, as the name suggests, inherent properties are soil properties that are really slow to change. They're things like soil texture. So your percentage of sand in your soil is going to be something that's pretty slow to change. Right. But soil also has dynamic properties, and this is really encouraging. So dynamic properties are going to be things that are responsive to phenomenons like invasion, but also to management tactics. And these are things like organic matter, soil structure, soil depth, water holding capacity, nutrient forms, and nutrient holding capacity. And all of these properties make good potential soil health metrics. So just to kind of summarize down here, soil health metrics are easily measured dynamic soil properties that inform us about ecosystem function within a system. So say, for example, we're interested in carbon cycling. So we might be interested in carbon cycling because we want to sequester carbon, or maybe we're interested in carbon cycling um, because we're just interested in long-term sustainable productivity of our site for forage production, for example. Well, at MPG already, we're doing um, some measurements of carbon cycling. So we're looking at soil respiration. Um, ILVA does this, and a lot of other people have been involved with it as well. And that gives us kind of an idea of microbial activity and root activity, um, which is uh, influenced by carbon in the soil. Um, but I would suggest that we might want to include a couple of other measurements of carbon cycling. We might consider including um, decomposition rates. So in the context of invasion and restoration, so we, say we have a really great intact site. We can measure decomposition rates there. We can then go to our invaded site, measure decomposition rates there to see if they're different, to see if our ecosystem is functioning differently in that invaded versus native site. And finally, we can go to our restoration treatments and look through time to see if decomposition rates are changing back to what we would expect to find in that native site. Along with these kind of rates of cycling, we can also look at pools. So one really um, simple thing to measure that's really informative is soil organic matter. Um, so in general, healthy soil tends to have more soil organic matter. So a greater ability to hold nutrients, hold water, um, and be productive through time. So if, if one of our interests, and I think it is, is uh, forage production and encouragement of wildlife, then plants need not only carbon to grow, but they also need nutrients. And in our system, nitrogen is often a limiting nutrient. So we might want to consider measuring some soil health metrics in this realm as well. So we're already measuring some things here. We're, um, we do have measurements for uh, at MPG of both total nitrogen in the soil and then soil nitrate. So total nitrogen in the soil, you can imagine it. So there, there's actually quite a bit of nitrogen in the soil, but plants can't get at most of it. You can kind of think of it as like a bucket of water. So total nitrogen is the whole bucket of water. The amount of nitrogen that plants can get at and use to put on biomass is just a few drops in that bucket. And that's going to include soil nitrate. But there are different forms of nitrogen that plants can make use of in the soil. So I would um, suggest that we consider also looking at a few different um, of these plant available forms of nitrogen. So we might want to consider both inorganic and organic nitrogen pool fractions. We also might want to take a look at nitrogen cycling rates. So this is also going to indicate to us how available nitrogen is for plants to take up. And finally, so taking it back to kind of the, con the context of invasion and restoration. So say we see a difference in the amount of plant available nitrogen um, between an invaded and a native site. Um, we might want to take a step further and say, OK, well, um, let's go ahead and look at how, uh, how these nutrients are being uh, acquired, and one way we can look at this is through nutrient-specific enzymes. 
So, these ends, so nutrient specific enzymes are extracellular enzymes that plants or microbes can exude when they um, are wanting to ac access a nutrient within the soil that's not in a form they can just grab and take up into their roots directly. And this can tell us a lot about um, what nutrients are available and what um, nutrients plants are limited by. Okay. Okay, with that, so now hopefully you have a little bit of an idea that invasion alters ecosystem function. Um, we can use soil me health metrics to kind of gauge our ecosystem function. Now I'm going to really focus it in for us here at MPG um, and tell you guys um, a couple of more things. First, uh, about some new analytical equipment that we recently purchased that's going to greatly enhance our in-house analysis capability for looking at some of these soil health metrics along with other things. And then I will also um, give you a rundown of some of the projects that I'm developing um, and I'm going to be working on this summer. Okay, so this is the analytical equipment. So thanks to um, Spencer and Nick for helping make sure there was access to computers and space in the lab and we weren't going to burn anything down when we installed this equipment. So on the left is the muffle furnace. The muffle furnace is kind of like a souped up oven. All right, so it gets up to 1,000 degrees C. What I use it for is soil organic matter determination and also for making really clean glassware for PLFA analysis. So some of you guys may know that Ilva was traveling to Sweden before to do PLFA analysis, and now we're doing it here in collaboration with another lab. Um, but we clean our glassware with this. And then the piece of equipment on the right is called a plate reader. So it's awesome. Um, <laughs> just to summarize, it's awesome. But it's, it is a spectrophotometer. It also measures fluorescence and luminescence. So as you're reading through the literature, so what I really want to stress with this plate reader is that, yes, I can run the plate reader and I know how to do a lot of nutrient-related analyses, but the plate reader is for everyone. And so if you come across a method in the literature that's anything that's colorimetric, fluorometric, or involves luminescence, it's something that we could potentially do in-house and we could do it on the plate reader. So just come talk to me and we'll see um, you know, how feasible it would be. And at the very end of the talk, I'll give you guys uh, just a big list of analyses that, are, that we're now able to do. And I'm glad to talk to anyone after um, about analyses you might be interested in incorporating in your research. All right, so just to recap. We have these awesome, sometimes we get to work in awesome native um, sites. However, more often we're usually working with um, invaded sites in some context or another. And we know that invasion alters the ecosystem function. And even after we've restored a site, sometimes we have these unexpected consequences of invaders lingering at a site. So now I'm going to tell you um, kind of four subject areas that we're going to start working on this summer in the context of ecosystem function. So the first kind of topic area that I get to help out with this summer is doing a little bit of monitoring and baseline data. So in the context of ecosystem function, these are the questions we might ask. What pools and cycling rates do we observe in areas within our system that we consider desirable? And by contrast, what do we observe in invaded or degraded areas? So you might be thinking to yourself, OK, we already have quite a bit of monitoring going on at MPG. Yes, we do. And it's awesome. And so I'm going to be taking advantage of and working at the phenology points, or the intensive study points. So already going on there, there's vegetation monitoring, there's phenology, bird point counts, and some soils data already, soils temperature and moisture monitoring. I'm going to just be, I'm, I'm, well, I'm proposing to do a little bit of additional soils monitoring at these points. So I'd like to look at um, monthly, um, monthly estimates of plant available nutrients, um, soil respiration, maybe a measurement of decomposition, um, measurements of soil nutrient cycling, and then finally we can subsample soil and freeze it for the future. If we find some interesting differences, um, for example in these sites, it, they're really cool in that they represent a lot of different uh, habitat types and they also have sites that are 
um, really nice intact native systems and then also restored um, systems and invaded systems. So we can compare plant available nutrients and nutrient cycling um, in the context of invasion save soil for the future, and if we want to dig deeper with, with enzymes or soil organic matter, we can. Next, I'd like to continue some of the work from my masters. Really just overall, um, in general, I'm interested in invaders. I really like leafy spurge. I think I mentioned that before, just because it's really aggressive, it's awesome. Really just, I know it sounds really horrible to say out loud, right? But um, really just has the, the ability to change a site, replace that native plant community. And it's not a known nitrogen fixer, so leafy spurge can put on a ton of biomass. In order to put on biomass, plants need nutrients like nitrogen. If nitrogen's limiting, where's that leafy spurge getting its nitrogen from? So I'm interested in asking questions related to this generally. So in collaboration with Bo, we've been talking about the possibility of plants like leafy spurge using alternate sources of nitrogen that we don't usually consider. Organic nitrogen, for example. Um, so that's something that we might spend a little bit of time looking at this summer. Next up, in um, collaboration with ILVA, I'll be working in the experimental plots. So the title here is Invasion Going Beyond Correlation. So uh, a big limitation of a lot of studies looking at invaders is that the studies are done out in the field. So we go to a site and we see invaders and there's a ton of biomass being produced, for example. And we say, okay, well, invasion is associated with this increase in biomass production, but we, d we can't tell if there's more biomass being produced at that site because of the invader or if the invader is just taking advantage of a more productive site. It's like a chicken and an egg problem. Fortunately for us at MPG, we have this um, network of experimental plots, experimental garden just up the hill from the orchard house. Um, it's been going for three or four years now. I sampled here in 2012, and um, before the experimental plots were established, the soil was tilled. It had all been the same. Um, it had all been similar plant community before, it was tilled, it was homogenized, so we know we're starting from ground zero, we're starting from similar productivity across that whole experimental garden. And now, um, they planted um, monocultures of different species of invader, and then also diverse native communities, and then we can look at differences in productivity and ecosystem function through time. So if we see um, increased amounts of productivity with invasion, we can start to say, oh, well, the invaders are causing changes that are leading to this increased productivity, rather than just being able to say, oh, it's just associated. So I measured, I got to sample in the experimental garden during my master's. I'd like to resample there again this year. I'm not gonna go into detail now, but I'm glad to talk about what I'm going to be sampling after. And kind of the final um, thing I'm going to talk about today is looking at restoration and legacy effects. So this was the last thing I brought up in my introduction. After we remove an invader from the landscape, what is the legacy of that invader below ground? Does this legacy hinder complete restoration of a site? And are restoration treatments shifting below ground function in expected and desirable ways? So are we seeing effects of these invaders even after we remove them? So there's two different um, ways I'll be starting to look into this this summer. First, the first way is just through the, through the plots that I mentioned before. So these are a mosaic of intact, native, restored, and invaded sites. So we have a grab bag of everything. So we can start to see if we're seeing differences. Um, and if we're seeing trends that make sense as far as restoration um, as compared to invaded or native sites. Secondly, um, in collaboration with Dan Mummy's group, I'm going to be sampling as they do work in the area of, can we call it crested wheatgrass eradication? Would that make sense? But in the interspecific competition experiment that's just getting going. So we're gonna get to sample um, for ecosystem function right at ground zero of a restoration treatment and then we'll follow it through the growing season and follow it through time to see if we get 
changes in function that we would expect as we try to reestablish native community at that site or in that big area. Okay, and this is the last slide I have for you guys. So this is just the list of analyses that we can do now that we have that new analytical equipment in house. Um, there's a couple things I want to point out. Yep, there's a lot of nutrient cycling stuff. That's what I'm most experienced with, but I've done um, almost all of these analyses. Uh, so I'm glad to talk about it. It's really just what we can do now with this new equipment is really just limited by the questions we ask in our imagination. So come to me and we'll talk about it and I'll see if we can analyze your samples in-house. Um, second thing I want to point out, so uh, Tegan didn't mention this, but hopefully I remember correctly. So I believe you sent scat samples away for protein analysis and we can do that in-house now. So if we're interested in looking at forage quality through scat, we can do that. We can also look at plant tissues directly so I don't have to handle scat if you guys don't need me to. And um, then I just wanted to point out this decomposition um, part right here. So a little bit later this spring, I have some contacts in the Forest Service and the Flathead Forest, and they're going to be setting up, they have a kind of a standard method that they use to measure decomposition, and I've been invited to go up there and see them set up that experiment. So if we're interested in um, installing similar decomposition experiments here and doing a little collaboration with the Forest Service, that might be a possibility as well. And that's all I have, so thank you guys.